that the words of that song will echo in our hearts, that we truly uh, lay our lives out before you, praying for a change, a change that uh, makes us more Christ-like every day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the way you uh, have loved us beyond anything we deserve. And we pray that as we worship this morning, that it would be pleasing to you, that it would reach your ears, and that you would know our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship together with music. Majesty, worship his majesty. great thou art.
an usher would come forward and we'll gather the morning offering. You okay? that you provide. We ask that as we bring our gifts and offerings and lay them before you, that you will show us exactly how we can use these to further your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
bandits want to come up today? Come on. Come on, Ava. Come on, Emmy. Don't make Cohen come all by himself. <laughs> all right. You know what I was reading about um, this last week in the Bible? It, it, was, um, it was a story about where the angel came to Mary, Jesus' mother, and she told, he told her exactly what name to give Jesus. And it was a really special name. It, it was the name Jesus. And, you know, way back then, they gave their children really special names. In fact, the names... She what? She wants Ba to come. Come on, Ba. Come on. Anyhow, um, they gave their children really special names. And their names meant something. And so that made me get to thinking, I wonder what our names mean. And so I looked them up. Do you know what my name means? My name is Nikki. Do you know what my name means? My name means victory. That tells me, that tells me why I like the song Victory in Jesus so good. Do you know what Cohen, do you know what your name means? Does mom and dad? Yeah. It means priest. What about Emerson? Emerson? It, no, it doesn't, girl. No, it doesn't. It means brave. Brave. And you know what Levi means? Harmony. I know he's common. Do you know what? I'd rather see your faces. They're really pretty. Okay? So I looked up the other kids' names, too. Do you know what Milo's name is? It means merciful. And Sawyer's name, of course, means woodcutter. That was pretty obvious. And Brooke's name was pretty obvious. It meant water or small stream. But I just think it's really cool how our names are special. Your name is special. Ava means, guess what Ava means? Hmm? Hmm. This is perfect, too, for her. Ava means lively <laughs> and bird-like. And she is. She's just like that. So it's funny how our names, even today, can mean something. But I thought it was really special that God wanted Jesus' name to be his name. And do you know what his name means? His name means Lord saves. And he died on the cross so that we could be saved. Isn't that neat? His name told what his job was going to be for us. So, How about if we pray real quick? Like this? Remember? Like this? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for these children. Thank you for the parents that named them um, names that have meaning and uh, thank you especially for Jesus, for more than his name, for what his life meant for us. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, this has been a, a busy week, I think, for everybody. Um, were you so busy you didn't run into God anywhere, or... Did you happen to meet him somewhere this week and made you go, oh, yeah, there he is. Uh, Sandy? Well, seven years ago, we um, were blessed to have a son join our, our family. <laughs> <laughs> that son's back there waving at him. <laughs> How sunburned is she, Frank? Did she keep the sun off of her? All right, good. Good, good, good. All right. Anybody else? Yes, Marie. I had somebody give me a beautiful planter of flowers the other day. Oh, yeah. Me too. <laughs>
<laughs> it was so sweet. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. I made a trip to Lindenwood Cemetery to honor my parents and also to update the things that there was bigger and stuff there. Aww. And that made me very happy. It's yeah. artificial stuff. I don't have to go out and water it, but it looks a lot nicer. It'll it. stay nice a long time, won't it? Yeah. So they make you take it off in the fall. Yeah. <laughs> they take it off. Yeah, if they do that. Yep. Anybody else? I am thankful to see Linda with us again today. I just am glad she's bringing back so good. She's a lot younger in heart than she thinks she is. All right. Are there special prayer concerns that we can lift up for one another? Any special needs? Yeah. Becky wasn't feeling well this morning. Don't she had come to bed at night and uh, she tried. She got ready to come and she just finally said, I can't, I can't go today. And I'd like to continue holding up prayers for my sister Deanna. Okay. Okay. So Becky, she's just not feeling well today. Deanna is still not, you know, still lingering with that awful cough. So, yeah. I got an appointment Wednesday with a vascular doctor because my CT scan showed clogged arteries in my abdomen, and that I asked the doctor if it's a surgery, and she said no, it's a procedure. So. <laughs> <laughs> what I do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A procedure, not surgery. <laughs> okay. But she said abdomen, or they said abdomen, not heart? No, not heart. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Prayers for Ken Kurtz. He's been having some health issues. Okay. Ken Kurtz. If you don't know him, he's uh, he's been a long time part of this community and uh, just a sweet man. So keep him lifted up. At the end of the school year, for everybody involved. <laughs> yeah. Terry. For our church, as we come closer to Jessica and to the other churches that are going through the same thing. Yeah. More? Okay, let's go to the Lord then, and we'll just take a few minutes to talk with him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with. Thank you that we can come together to worship you, to celebrate what Jesus has done for us, for our lives as we move forward as a, a church, and, and just all the beauty that you pour into us. We thank you for the children and for the life they bring to us here at, at um, our Cola Church, how, uh, how it's just fun to hear those noises and to know that uh, they are learning about you and uh, that they are here because their parents care and their grandparents and their extended family. They all would like to see these children grow up knowing you and we want to do our part in helping that. Lord, we think about our church and all of the other churches uh, nationwide that are in the disaffiliation process right now. Uh, it's uh, coming right down to the wire with annual conferences happening between now and the end of June all over the United States. And we pray for each one of the churches as they have chosen to move in a slightly different direction than what the United Methodist denomination is moving right now. We pray that uh, leaders will step forward in these churches and that, that um, each church will find its way 
um, that's pleasing to you, that they will stay in your will, Lord, seeking it as they move forward. And we pray, too, for the United Methodist denomination. We pray that that they will continue in the ways that they have so many years of laying forth the story of Jesus so that others can come to know him as their Savior and Lord. Lord, you've heard our requests for individuals here in our church and in our church family and in our individual families. We lift up Becky to you this morning and we pray for her, Lord. We pray that she'll feel better quickly. We know that, um, that she does not um, miss very often and so we know that for her to stay home that she's not feeling very well and so we, we just pray for her to uh, get her health back quickly. We lift Deanna to you too, Lord. Um, she has been through so much in the past year or several months anyhow and with uh, treatments and surgeries and everything that's going on. We just pray that, that she will find doctors that can help with this seemingly endless cough. Help her to, uh, to find out what's going on and then to develop a treatment that will make her feel better. We pray for Nancy as she goes in for uh, a procedure this week, Lord. We just pray that not only will it open a clogged artery, but it might uh, help her to not feel so anxious. Sometimes um, you know, our mental state is uh, part of our physical being, and, and sometimes it's uh, a good indicator that there's something going on uh, in our bodies. So we just pray for her in many ways. We lift up Kenny Kurtz. We pray, Lord, that you will give him strength and healing and help him to feel better and to be able to be out in the community. He, he loves uh, being with people and around people. He's a real servant when it comes to Lions Club and, and to many other organizations or, or groups of people that he's uh, working with. And so we just ask that you would touch him and give him strength and healing. And we thank the Lord about the school year being so nearly over. And we pray for the teachers as they wrap up all of their classes and grades and uh, get ready for hopefully a little bit of rest and uh, that uh, the children will understand uh, that end of the year is not a time to just uh, break out and go wild, but that it's a time that they can celebrate uh, the end of this year and look forward to next year as they move ahead in their classes. Lord, we pray especially for our dream team tomorrow evening as they meet. We pray that you will send uh, everyone to that table that has a, a, a yearning or a desire to see our Cola Community Church grow and thrive and be a strong witness for Jesus in, in our community. And we pray that as we move forward, that we always listen to your voice first and that we follow your will in every way. Lord, we're ready for uh, new dreams, new hopes, new possibilities for our church and even for our own lives. And we, we're willing to surrender and, and to follow you faithfully onto these new roadways, these new adventures that you're opening up for us. So Lord, we give ourselves to you. We give our church to you. And we pray that we will listen and be obedient. Lord, we are your children. And we gather this morning and we pray as your children have prayed for centuries. 
saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts. Um, we're going to be starting a, a new series today, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and it's um, pretty appropriate because it, it, the book of Acts is the story of how the Christian church began, how it got started, and what it did during those early centuries. And so um, our lesson comes from chapter 10 this morning. It begins with um, yeah, verse 23, I think. No, 34, that's where we go. Verse 34, and goes to the end of 43. It's, this is a story about Peter um, and how, he, how God was using him in this moment to minister to uh, a man named Cornelius. So it says, uh, Then Peter began to speak. He said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he then went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. Well, like I said, we're going to start a, a new series, and it, it's... Um, it's going to help us, I think, learn how to live in a way that, um, that we can touch lives, that we can leave a legacy. You might call it kind of living forward. Um, Steve Jobs, who was connected with Apple for years, often used the phrase, let's make a dent in the universe. He was talking about what kind of what we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. He was talking about living a life that leaves a mark on the world around you. So this series is going to be made up of eight weeks, and it's going to be, um, we're going to be talking about eight purposes that we as Christians need to adopt in order to, to reach our full potential as followers of Christ. These purposes we find right here in the book of Acts. And um, we're going to come to understand that they are the same purposes that these early believers that started the Christian church followed. You see, there's a real reason why the church started with just a handful of actually discouraged people. But within just a couple of hundred years, that movement became a global force for good. 
It had nothing to do with political power or military strength, but it had everything to do with this unstoppable force that comes when a life is changed through Jesus Christ. So, um, these eight purposes, we're going to, Terry and I are going to challenge you to adopt them as, as your own. Each one of us. We'll also be talking about how these eight purposes will be really good tools for us as a church to use in our community to, to reach new people for Jesus Christ in the world around us. Like I said, <clears throat> this morning's lesson uh, tells about the Apostle Peter talking about Jesus, telling this gentleman named Cornelius about Jesus. Before I go further into that, though, <coughs> I want to ask you three questions. You can write them down, because I, I hope you'll uh, go home and answer them, even if you don't this morning. Question number one. If you could sum up your life, up to today anyhow, in a single sentence, what would you say? If you could sum up your life in a single sentence, what would you say? Maybe something like, oh, I have a tendency to take the easy way. Or maybe, I always look out for myself. Or maybe you say, I dot every I and I cross every T and I follow all the rules. How would you summarize your life? Question two. How would those closest to you summarize your life up to this point? I'm not talking about your enemies. I'm talking about those who know you best those that love you the most, how would they, being fair and accurate, summarize your life up to this point? Would they say things like, well, she's got a good heart, but you can't count on her. Or maybe they'd say, he's got an explosive temper, sometimes you just got to get out of his way. What would the people that know you the best say about your life up to this point? And question number three, can you guess what that one is? Mm. How would you want your life to be summarized by our Heavenly Father? What would he say? I want you to think about those three questions this week. I'm not going to ask for answers, but I hope you will answer them. Because I think if you really are honest with yourself, you probably are going to realize that most times we come up a little bit short, short of our potential. You know, when Jesus walked among us, he told us what his life was about. And we could, on this side of the cross, we can see what his actions proved. You know, he said, the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. He did that. He also said, I've come that we may have life and have it to the full. Now, I think most of us as Christians, I think we accept that action of salvation pretty good. I think we understand that. I think we believe that he died for us. But I'm not sure about the second part. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I'm not sure that we live to the fullest of what Jesus wants us to live right now. Okay, back to the question of, <clears throat> about how you might summarize your life. 
Shortly after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Peter, you remember, outspoken, brash, not much slowed him down, Peter. Well, he was invited to a man's house to talk to him about the Christian faith. That man's name was Cornelius. He was a soldier in the Roman army. He was not a Jew. He was what they called a God-fearer. Now, a God-fearing person meant that he was a moral person. He was a good person, but he was not Jewish. He did not follow the Jewish dietary laws or the sacrificial laws of the Jews. But he was considered a good person. The Bible says that he was generous to the poor and he prayed to God regularly. Then one day he had a vision in which the angel told him, in effect, your good deeds have not gone unnoticed and if you really want to know what life in God is all about, you need to talk to a man named Peter. So Cornelius sent for Peter. Peter came to his house and he told him all about Jesus. He even preached a a short little sermon, and that day Cornelius was saved, he was baptized, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Hear that part? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He went from being merely a a God-fearing Gentile to a Spirit-filled follower of Jesus. It's really a great story. And if you've got some time this week, look it up, read it, study it a little bit. Uh, Today, though, I want to zero in on one verse in that story. In fact, one phrase, just one part of that verse. Um, Peter, he explained Jesus' life in such a simple yet elegant way in that verse. And I think it should inspire all of us to try to live the same way. I mean, after all, we're followers of Jesus. Here's the verse, verse 38, chapter 10 of Acts. How God, it starts with how God anointed Jesus. He was telling Cornelius how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and how he went around then doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. That's the key verse. The key phrase is, he went around doing good because God was with him. I think that's an incredible way to summarize Jesus' life. Now, there are many things about Jesus that you and I can never, ever, ever, ever duplicate. But I think this is one something that we could, that we can, that we should try to duplicate in our lives. He went around doing good. If that's the best way to summarize the life of Jesus, then I think it should also summarize the lives of his followers, that we too should go around doing good. I read a story about a young man named Luke Cameron that lives in England. He had a close family friend, a woman that was kind of like his second mom, and she died of cancer. And Luke was devastated, and as a way of honoring her life and her memory, he resolved to do one good deed every day. He began his project on January 1st, 2020. His first good deed was that he said Happy New Year to the woman who served him at the cafe. It's kind of an inauspicious start, isn't it? But over the following weeks and months, he continued to seek out opportunities to do at least one good deed each and every day. For example, he bought food for homeless people. He gave spare change to a woman who didn't have enough money for a parking meter. He baked cupcakes and sent them to his friends and family. He took out the neighbor's trash. He picked up litter along the parkway. 
every day at least one good deed for 365 days. He also blogged about his experience mostly as a way of keeping himself accountable, but also to perhaps inspire others. His habit of doing good deeds every day took root in his life, and it's changed the way he lives. Today, I'm saying that every believer and every church should adopt that value as their own. Just like D Jesus did, we need to go around doing good at all opportunities. I think most of you know John Wesley. Um, he began the Methodist denomination. He was an Anglican priest. And in the 18th and 19th century, his ministry led to a great revival, both in Great Britain and here in the United States. Thousands and thousands of people came to Christ. You see, he had a way of cutting through the religious ritualism, if you want to call it, call it that, the meaningless formalities. And, and instead, he focused on what he considered to be the essence of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus. He summarized the Christian life in three general rules, three really simple little rules that every committed Christian needs to live by. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. Pretty simple, aren't they? He said, we do no harm by avoiding all evil, evil of every kind, especially that which is most generally practiced. You see, sometimes when a sinful behavior hits that critical mass stage, we fool ourselves into thinking that, oh, it must be okay because everybody else is doing it, so it must be okay. Wesley wanted new believers to understand that that kind of thinking just didn't fly because everyone else is doing it doesn't make it right. He's saying that a faithful follower of Jesus will not do anything that could harm someone else. His second rule, do good, uh, paraphrasing it a little bit, that rule says that we should be as merciful as we have the power to be, and at every opportunity to do good of every possible sort to all. Do good. Wonder where he read that. Wonder where he heard about that. Hmm. Probably from Jesus. Wesley's third general rule was stay in love with God. We do this by attending to all the ordinances of God. Things like prayer and Bible study and worship and fellowship, service. Wesley's message to believers was that if you will follow these three general rules, you will become an effective disciple of Jesus Christ. These rules are simple, right? Well, sometimes... Sometimes, at least for me, they seem pretty difficult. Can you imagine living a lifestyle for yourself where you always go around doing good of every possible sort at every opportunity? In these last few minutes, I want to I want us to look at three phrases that are essential to living that kind of a life. In our verse today, we see that in order to have a, a doing good at every opportunity lifestyle, we need to keep in mind, first of all, it requires the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Now in the coming weeks, we're going to talk quite a bit about the Holy Spirit's work in our life. 
that's what our Bible study has been about and is going to be about for the next, well, we've got three more weeks, I think, of that. It's what the Holy Spirit's job is, how he does it, how it affects us, how it affects how he affects our church and what we do. And we'll see again and again that it takes the Holy Spirit and his power in our life for us to even be able to do good at every opportunity. Being filled with the Holy Spirit does empower us to do things that we aren't able to do on our own, like to show compassion, to be bold, to be generous. Those are just things that are not in everybody's wheelhouse, let me tell you. But the Holy Spirit anoints you with power to do the work of God. Think of it this way. If Jesus needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and it says he was, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon him at his baptism, how much more do you and I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit? So I hope you'll make this prayer your everyday prayer. Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Anoint me with your Spirit. Give me the power to do what I am otherwise powerless to do. That's an essential. When a church or an individual makes it their mission to go around doing good, they soon find out that it's impossible without the power of the Holy Spirit. He changes a mere good deed into a God deed, an act of kindness or mercy or, or generosity that can change somebody's life. You can't do that all on your own. The second truth is that doing good at every opportunity can often lead you into a spiritual battle. I want you to understand. I, I'm not just talking about a, a surface-level, do-good kind of life. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. When you commit to go around doing good at every opportunity, you'll find yourself in situations sometimes that only God can get you through. People may come into your life who are, who are under financial oppression, and maybe you can help them. But it might mean that you have to spend less on yourself. People will come into your life who are struggling with depression or loneliness or grief. And you'll have the opportunity to help them. But it might mean that you have to let go of some of your free time. There will also be times when you have the opportunity to help someone who's gotten themselves into a a sinful, destructive, and maybe even dangerous situation. Let me tell you then, the temptation may be at that point to say, good luck, I'm, I'm on my way, I can't help. But if you're really committed to doing good at every turn, you'll stand with them, even in their darkest moment, and you'll help them through the dark valley. If you make it your mission to go around doing good, you will from time to time find yourself in a tight spot. A commitment to go around doing good is not for the faint of heart. It requires courage because sometimes you come face to face with darkness. Going around doing good requires the power of the Holy Spirit. It often leads you in the direction of spiritual battle. And the third thing is it's an evidence of God's presence in your life. Verse 38 said he went around doing good because God was with him. When you walk with God, it's impossible not to want to do good. You want to help others. Just like Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. 
a natural result of God's presence in your life is that you want to be a blessing to others. Being good is not something we can accomplish on our own. In fact, many times, the more we try to be good, the more we mess things up. When Jesus died on the cross on that late Friday afternoon, somehow, some way, all the sins of the world were laid upon his shoulder. Your sins, my sins, the world's sins. Every sin that would ever be committed was laid upon him. When he died, when he died, the power of sin died with him. He paid the price for every sin. He was then laid in a tomb. And then on Sunday, his cold, dead body suddenly came to life. Perhaps a different kind of life, a resurrected life that proved once and for all that he has the power to overcome sin and death. Even though we don't have it in us to be all that good, he wants to pour all that goodness, his goodness, into each and every one of us. He wants to enter each of us into our hearts. He wants us to be able to go around doing good because he is with us. Now, there may be some here today that have never made the decision to really connect with Jesus. Well, maybe you've come to church for years or maybe only once in a while. But you've just never quite given all of yourself to him. Because of that, the idea of going around doing good all the time at every turn seems just a little bit out of your reach. But I want to invite you today to make that connection with Christ. It's as simple as turning away from the past, asking him to come into your heart today, asking him to give you a new heart, to forgive your sins, to give you a new life, a new future, new hope. His presence will give your life new purpose. Purpose to go around doing good at every opportunity. If you're already a Christian, I just want to remind you today that God's presence in your life gives you the power to live according to this principle. If you're committed to doing it, believe me, the opportunities will come. Sometimes it will be as simple as is letting someone merge into traffic ahead of you. Sometimes it'll be as challenging as walking with someone through the darkest moments of their life. I asked you earlier how or, or, or what others might say about your life, how they might summarize your life. Well, maybe when you answered that for yourself, you felt pretty good about it. Or maybe you didn't. But here's the good news. You can change the answer starting today. Through the Holy Spirit, you have the power to do it. Because God is with you. And because he's with you, you can go around doing good in such a way that it defines the mark you make on the world around you, you can make a difference. Amen. Let's stand and join together in our closing hymn today. Freely, freely. Shall we stand?
how'd you go this week? Try to try to keep in mind those three little uh, three little rules. Just do good. What word? Stay in love with Jesus. Do no harm. You've been given the power to do that. You already enjoy the uh, living to the full if you take hold of it. Help others to know who Jesus is by showing your love, the love that Jesus places in your heart. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And do good all that you can. Amen.